I'm calling this message today, Don't Be Slipping. I'm talking about how we can get off course, how we can be on a good path and, and all of a sudden, next thing you know, we've fallen, we've taken a detour, and we find ourselves in a place that we didn't intend to find ourselves in. Galatians 6.1 will be our text today. Let me read that to you. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual or you who are walking with the Lord at the time, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Now, I want to focus for a moment on that word trespass. What, what is a trespass? Well, to understand this word and its meaning here, we have to look at the word in its original language, which was Greek. Sometimes uh, we don't get a, a clear meaning when it's translated over to English. The Greek word for trespass is paraptoma, paraptoma. It means, one of the meanings is it's a side slip. It, it's just all of a sudden you're walking and you just slide off or you step off. It can be intentional. It can be an intentional sin, an intentional wrong move, or it can be unintentional where all of a sudden you just <clears throat> don't realize, oh, my goodness, I just made a boo-boo and, oh, my goodness, I, oh, I'm, I'm in a fix now. I, I did something that is wrong. Whatever the case may be, it's getting off the good path and stepping on to a bad path. For instance, let me give you a, a, an example of a trespass. I think King David's sin, infamous sin with Bathsheba, I think that was a trespass. I don't think David woke up and said, you know what, who can I commit adultery with today? Hmm, who's going to be my... No, I, I think he got up and just planned on being a king. I think he went about his normal thing. And then for whatever reason it says that he couldn't sleep, he woke up, went out on his terrace, looked down, and a woman was bathing in the light, and, and that started the ball rolling. But I don't think he woke up intending that. I think he just fell into it. He, he took a sidestep. I believe that's how most of us sin. I don't believe many of you wake up and say, you know what, what's it going to be today? What am I in the mood for? Do I want a little immorality? Do I want a little stealing? Do I want a little losing my temper? Am I just going to just blow up and be like, well, what am I going to do today? No, I, don't, I think most of you, most of us wake up saying, I want to do right today. I'm gonna, I want to follow God. I want to do uh, the things that I should do as a Christian but yet somehow, some way, something happens. You, 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 you get slipped up. You get off the path, and you find yourself at a place like, how did I get here? I didn't plan on this. This wasn't in my daily to-do list today. I think what I've seen in experience and what I see in Scripture, there's three causes that we have spiritual slips. Here's the first one. It's when we let our guard down. We just let our guard down. It says in Galatians 1 there that we get caught in these trespasses. The word caught, again, we have to go to the Greek to get, I think, the full meaning of it. One of the definitions of it is to surprise. We get surprised. We get caught in a sin. We get surprised like, whoa, what happened here? Oh my goodness, I didn't see that coming. It's a spiritual sucker punch. All of a sudden, everything going good and boom, what the heck just hit me? And all of a sudden now you're like, whoa, man. That's how most of us sin. We lose our temper. We have a momentary lapse in discretion. We have passion that gets a little bit unbridled and it gets loose. And next thing we know, we've committed a trespass. Now, the Bible warns us against letting our guard down. 1 Peter 5 and 8 says, be of sober spirit. That doesn't mean don't be a drunk, although it could apply that there. But what it's saying is, take this thing serious. Take your walk with the Lord serious because you have a, a, an enemy who's out there. So, so, so take this thing serious. Don't, don't just be thinking this is just fun and games. This is a very real thing. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Do you realize the devil never takes a day off? He, he never says, oh, you know what, uh, uh, next week is you know, Martin Luther King Day or next week is uh, Christmas or next week is President's Day. He, he doesn't say, oh, you know, I'm just going to give you a break. You know, you, you, you got to pass today. <laughs> no attack for me. I'm, I'm celebrating this holiday. No, he's at you always. He's prowling. And you know what? The dude's appetite is never satisfied. 
He may eat your neighbor yesterday, but he's coming after you today. And once he gets you today, he'll go after your spouse tomorrow. He's, he's, he's always hungry. He's always prowling. And he's waiting for you to let your guard down. So you've got to keep that guard up. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, it goes to the next one, we have to rely or we get tripped up when we rely on our own strength. Oh, this is such a, a mistake when we think that we can live this life in our own power. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. You can't be the husband. You can't be the wife. You can't be the dad. You can't be the mom. You can't be the friend. You can't be the Christian in your own power. You can't just say, I'm just going to not smoke, cuss, chew, or I won't go with any who do, and that's my thing. I'm just going to do, not do these three things. No, that, that's not it. You need power. you got to wake up every day and say, I need power. James 4, 6, and 7 uh, puts it this way. But he, God, gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud. People that, that think they can do it in their own power, God says, fine, I, you and I can't connect. If you're going to do it in your own power, have at it. But it says that he gives grace to the humble. Those that realize, I need him. I can't do it. He's good. I'll, I'll give you grace. Submit, therefore, to God. And when you do that, he says, <clears throat> then resist the devil, and you'll have power, and then he will flee. He'll flee. But you got to have the power to be able to resist. You have to wake up. I have to wake up every day and say, Lord, you know what? If you don't come alive in me today, if your power isn't moving today, I'm done. Because I, I don't have the patience. I don't have the self-control. I don't have the, the drive. I'll just get apathetic. I'll just want to just go live in Kansas in a hut and hunt pheasants for the rest of my life. I won't, don't want to be around people. God, I need you to come in me today. And when I do that, I have strength. If I don't do that, I don't have strength. So you get filled with God, and then you'll have the ability to resist. And we have to learn to resist. We have to learn to stand firm. We can't be quitters. So many times I think we're right on the edge of making it through a trial, making it through a temptation. We've prayed. We've asked God to help us. And, and, and we're there. I mean, for whatever reason, we just, we just grow weary and, and we quit. I'm convinced we quit oftentimes just a year too soon, a month too soon, maybe a day too soon. If we'd have just held on and said, no, I'm going to, God, give me strength today. I'm going to resist. I'm being tempted. I'm going to resist. God, I'm just going to resist. And then eventually it says, once that's done, the spiritual attack will leave. It says Satan will flee. He'll leave. There's a, an actual phenomenon. I don't know how to explain it, but I felt that. I felt when I'm under attack and if I'm resisting, eventually, I mean, my mind's being bombarded. I'm being discouraged. I'm being just, just everything. I just, ugh, I just feel ucky inside and just feel, I know I'm under attack here. I'm short and, you know, everything's bugging me and I know it. I'm under attack. But if I'll just hang in there and keep doing what I should be doing and God help me, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, boom, it's gone. I'm thinking better. I'm not discouraged. I'm, I'm happy again. Things aren't so bad. I thought things were horrible. Things aren't so bad again. And, and it's because I resisted. And for some reason, I guess Satan left. He's moving down the road to, to my neighbor, I guess. But hang in there. You just got to resist. Thirdly, we get off track when we, and fall into a trespass, when we take something too soon. Before it's ready. The word for caught that we have here, anyone who is caught in a trespass, it's an interesting word. It has varied uses. Very, very interesting. One of the usages is found in a place I never would have imagined it to be found. It's found in 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 21, in the teaching about communion of all places. It says, for in your eating, one takes... That, that's the word right there, prolambano. One prolambano, his own supper first, one is hungry, and another is drunk. The use is, is the definition is, is before it's ready, out of order. Not time yet. Here's what was taking place there. I hope you understand it. 
the early believers that Paul's referring to uh, would meet for church, specifically for communion. Communion is one of the two uh, customs, one of the two sacraments that Jesus told the church all the way up until he comes back again to maintain. Uh, he says, when you gather, have communion. And we do that. We do that. In fact, we do it every time we have service. You can have communion in the back, back there. We do it as a church on our first Wednesday that we have. Uh, have communion. The second uh, one is baptisms, the second sacrament. Ironically, we're doing that today uh, after this service. But they would gather together for communion. But before we, they would do that, they would get together for the precursor of the church potluck. They call it a love feast. How many of you grew up in church going to church potlucks? Okay. How many of you young believers, young people, you've never been to a church potluck? You're not missing much. <laughs> Eating food that you don't know who cooked it. If you're polite, you wait. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'll get, go ahead. Don't ever do that in church potluck. Be selfish and greedy. Get at the front of the line. Because by the time you get there at the end of the line, you got all the stuff that nobody wanted there. That thing, that's a chicken thing, and you don't even know what it is. And spaghetti has got no sauce on it. It's got noodles, you, the corner of it, you throw it in your plate and stuff. But they would gather together for the love feast, and it was a beautiful concept. You've got to get this. The gospel was the most socially unifying thing that had ever happened. I believe it's still the most unifying thing in our world that we can gather today. You can clap for that one. You can clap for that one. You can gather today in a service like this and you've got men and women sitting next to each other. That didn't happen in those days. In those days, guys would be here and gals would be there. You didn't sit together. Now we all sit together. Why? Because there's neither Jew nor Greek nor male or female. You had Gentiles and you had Jews, mixed races sitting together where they were arch enemies. Now they're sitting together having Christ in common, keeping their distinctness, but yet having Christ in common. You had the rich. You had the poor. They never rubbed shoulders. Now they're all in the same church. And it was beautiful until some folks said, hey, you know what, every time we get together these potluck, man, I notice that you bring, you know, shrimp scampi and Harry, you bring filet mignon and man, you bring it out there and you haven't even got, you know, away from the table yet and everybody's digging in. By the time you get up there, it's all gone. So, hey, I tell you what let's do. Put a notice at the country club. Tell everybody we're going to meet an hour early. The potluck meets at six. Let's get here at five. And hey, bring, bring next a dose of that scampi, next to helping. I love it. So the rich were getting there. And they were eating before everybody else got there. And Paul says, what are you doing? You, you guys are eating before you get here. He says, man, if you're going to eat that stuff, do it at home. Don't come and, and do it in the church and just kind of, you're creating division here. And some of you, man, you're coming here drunk. Besides, he says, you're, you're, you're defeating the whole purpose. This is to unify, but instead it's dividing. See, it wasn't wrong to eat what they're eating. The timing was wrong. It was all about timing, not the eating itself, when they were eating. And see, that's the picture here of a being caught. It's a wrong time. I perform weddings here in town at a venue that needs officiants. Uh, I got a friend of mine that I do weddings for. Uh, Allows me to spoil my grandkids with that money. And most of those folks, to my knowledge, aren't Christians. There are a few that, that their faith comes out and we have great fellowship. But, but a lot of the folks, uh, to my knowledge, aren't Christians. I've been blown away at something that in the last number of years, probably if I have 10 couples that, that I marry, over half of them are already living together. And all of them say, we've been together 10 years. We've been together three years. And, and some of them, yeah, we got, you know, here's my three kids we have together. And they've been, you know, having a family and now just getting around to getting legally married. And here's what I'm saying. Living in the same house, having a family is a good thing. I'm not coming against kids. I'm not coming against people getting together. It's about timing, though. Their timing is just off. 
family's good, kids are good, but the timing is off. Now, I hope that Valley of Vegas is living differently than that. I hope, couples, that you guys are waiting until you get married before you move in together and, and before you start a family. Now, I understand we've got a lot of folks that are coming out of the world. I get it. You're coming out. You're living together. I understand you have families. I'm not talking to you. Uh, well, I am talking to you, but I'm giving you a little bit of a, of a, of a grace time here. Uh, and we want to help you. We want to help you. Here's how we can help you. If you're here and you're in that situation and, and God's convicting your heart and you want to get it right, we want to help you get it right. I'm going to offer you what we call here our Wednesday night special. You buy a marriage license. You come down here on a Wednesday night, attend service, and, and invite whoever you want to come. And after service, we'll do it right here. We'll go up to the prayer room. We'll go in the green room. And we'll have a wedding. We'll have a wedding. Wednesday night special. Now, don't come to us and say, Pastor, I just met uh, this, this uh, I just met my girlfriend. Uh, I just met her at Sunday fun day last week. We want to get married. No, 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 no. Premarital counseling, just get to know each other first. But if you're in that other situation, talk about we can help you. L l let me finish. Let me conclude with this. We get caught up in trespasses. But the second part of verse 1 says this. Galatians 6, 1. If anyone's caught, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking at yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Here, here's the thought. If, saying, if you see someone and, 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 and you can help them, they invite you in, help them up. They're, they're off track. They've fallen down. But by all means, don't just grab them. That word restore means to mend or to put back into place. It's like a broken leg, maybe a compound fracture, maybe a dislocated knee. It says be gentle, help them get that back. Don't just say, here, you want some help? And just pull that thing. Ah, you'll leave them worse off than they were. Be gentle. And, and, and why? Because you too may be tempted. Look into yourself. How would you like to be in that situation? How would you like to be treated if you fell down? We'll treat them that way as well. And by doing that, it says in verse 2, by doing that, you're bearing one another's burdens and thereby fulfilling the law of Christ. You're serving God by helping people. How? By fulfilling the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? Easy. Two things. Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And what's the second one? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the law of Christ. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love him, help him as if you were helping yourself. Keep that in mind. Now, here's, here's some things to keep in mind when you do that. Number one, make sure they've asked for your help. Don't just assume they want your help because some people don't want to be helped. Or some people will say, well, get out of my business. I have invited you in here's thing. So, so don't get in their business unless you've been invited in. Number two, be gentle. Their sin has them in pain. By the time it comes to the place where they invite you in, ask for some help. Hey, man, can I tell you what's going on? Will you pray for me? At that point when it's out, you don't need to convict them. You don't need to say, yeah, I'll help you. But first, uh, what were you thinking? How dumb are you? Man, you've been a Christian for five years. I can't believe it. No, they're already convicted. They're, they're, they're conv That's why they're telling you, pray for me. I'm goofing up. So you don't got to convict them. They just need comforting. Thirdly, help them get back on the good path. Help them. Don't just say, you know, I'll pray for you, brother. But if you can help, help them. How? By encouraging them. Follow up. Accompany them to places that they need to be, places that will help them get back on track. Hey, man, you want to go to church? I don't have a ride. I'll come get you. Hey, you want to go to the marriage conference? You want to go to the uh, Monday night connect with the ladies? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll come get you. I'll meet you there. You can sit at my table. Help them get back on track. I'll end with this. I promised you something I'm going to fulfill. I promised you a couple of weeks ago when I ran out of time, I would tell you the story of Teddy. It's one of Valley Vegas's Valley Bible Fellowship's all-time great testimonies in the nearly 50-year history of our church. Uh, here's what happened. Uh, years ago, I want to say 2008, 2009, at our old building up at uh, Flamingo and Durango, 
Pastor Ron was uh, speaking over here more often, and, and he brought Debbie over one time, and they went down to Fremont Street and uh, just kind of looking around, see if God wanted to use them and just kind of being tourists. Well, they walked past. Uh, there was a, a line of homeless guys sitting there kind of on the ledge of a casino. He said, but one stood out. He said he didn't fit. He just didn't fit. So they walked by him and closer, well, and he kind of looked up, and they said, man, this guy didn't fit. Walked back later and, oh, sir, and Pastor Ron said, I'm going to ask him if he needs hungry. Sir, are you hungry? He goes, yeah, I, I can, I'm hungry. Would you like a hamburger? Yes, that'd be great. Pastor Ron Debbie went down, bought him some hamburgers, came back, and, and, and uh, here he goes, sir, what's your name, sir? He goes, Ted. Go, Ted, I'm going to pray for you. All right. So they went, got in their car, were driving out, literally left the parking lot. All of a sudden, Debbie says, Ron, we can't leave. And Ron said, I'm saying the same thing. I knew we weren't supposed to leave. God wants to do more. So they turned around, parked, walked back to Fremont Street, and there was Teddy still, and said, sir, we'd like to get you a room for tonight. And it was, I think it was in the fall, getting cold at night. Oh, thank you. So they took him down, to, I think it was the Californian down there, um, across from the bus station, took him down there, got him a couple nights, and then Pastor Ron left. And so he left, he says, hey, I, he told me the story. I, said, I ran into this guy, he said, can you check on him? I said, yeah, I'll check on him. So I went down there. Uh, one night, and sure enough, there's Ted sitting there. And I said, Ted, I said, uh, I'm Doug, and Pastor Ron sent me down here, and what's going on? I said, well, why are you out here? He goes, well, I, I get $615 a month Social Security, uh, but that only lasts me about uh, 15 days. I, I stay in this hotel over here, and about the 15th, 16th of the month, I run out of money, and so I, I'm out on the streets until the first again. So I just kind of hang out at the casinos. Uh, I, I all you know hang out here and, and just work safe and stuff. I sleep on the bench. I said, "Oh my gosh, his you know he, he wasn't totally dirty. He act, if, he's remarkably clean for living uh, on the streets, but you could tell he wasn't well. He just wasn't well." And I said, oh, Ted, I said, well, hey, we're going to help you. So we got him a room. I think we got him a room for seven days that time. And that began a process where I'd head down there about the 15th of the month and see Ted. And we did that for a couple of months. I said, wait a second. We can't keep doing this. This isn't sustainable. We've got to get a permanent solution. I said, Ted, we want to get you off the streets. We want to get you an apartment. Oh, that'd be great. I only have $615 a month. I said, well, let me see what we can do. And I looked around, and I found a brand-new senior apartment area down there, beautiful, that was only like $300 a month or something, uh, government-assisted. Uh, but the problem was I had like a six-month waiting list. And, oh, man, I said, well, let's, let me get my name on there and told her our story, what's going on with this guy. And so I told everybody, pray, 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 pray. We need God to open the door, pray. And son of a gun, two weeks later, I get a phone call. Hey, Mr. Lowman, yeah, our, we, we have a, a unit open. Would you like to come down? She wasn't done talking. I was, boom, dropped the phone. I was gone. <laughs> Gave her the money. Got Teddy in there, rounded up some furniture for him and, and pots and pans, a few clothes for him. And by this time, it was summer. And, and so we set the thermostat for him. We set it at, I said, Teddy, how do you like it? Is this feel good? Yeah, okay, this is 72. Just leave it here. I said, Teddy, this is, it's on auto. Just leave it, leave it there. And uh, it, it's, it'll be fine. Okay. So we, were, we started bringing him food every week. So I made my food run. I did this for about a year. I made, made a food run and brought him some food. And I walked in there and it was a sauna. And there's Teddy in a recliner in his underwear sitting there with a cold towel in his head. Just laying, laying out, Teddy, what are you doing? Oh, he called me Parson. Pastor instead of Parson, Parson, like Parson Brown in the Christmas tune. Old school. He's from Pottstown, Pennsylvania. Ted Kovaluk, Polish guy. Uh, Parson, I got, I got cold last night, so I, I turned the air down. I said, no, you didn't turn the air down. You turned the heater on. Heater was on. He sw switched it over. It's like 77 in there. I said, Teddy, I said, this is automatic. You don't have to touch it. If you get cold, pull a blanket out. But leave this thing alone. Okay, Parson, come back next week. Teddy, and it's hot again. Anyway, we went through that. I brought in my daughter-in-law, married to my son Seth, and they, they came in, and she started uh, helping. And Carrie said, I wonder if he has any family. So she, she kind of pumped him a little bit. He was very hesitant to tell us what was going on. To this day, I don't know what led him to be homeless. He, he never disclosed it, and I didn't feel it was my place to push it if he wasn't going to disclose it. 
But, but he uh, did tell us he had family in Michigan. So my daughter-in-law got on uh, social media and found a relative in Michigan and called her and said, uh, hi, I'm Carrie, and we have a man by the name of Ted Kovalak. Is he your relative? Oh, my gosh, that's my brother-in-law. We have not heard from Ted for years. We didn't know if he was alive or dead. I said, well, he's alive, she said. He's here in Las Vegas. <clears throat> Janet was her name, married to Ted's brother, Mike, who was a pastor and had passed away. Janet was now a widow. So we made arrangements, and, and we flew Ted back to meet his family in Michigan who hadn't seen him for years. So he went back to Michigan, stayed a week, came back, and how would you enjoy your trip, Ted? Oh, it was good, Parson. I really enjoyed it. And, and uh, in fact, they want to bring me out again next month. So next month, he said, they're flying me out. So they flew Teddy out. And then I lost contact for three weeks. I call him, no answer in his apartment, call him. And, and I wouldn't try as long as he'd be gone. It was a month later. He comes back and, and says, hey, Parson, I'm back. And come pick me up for church. We, I'd pick him up for church and bring him up to the building up there. And he says, Parson, on the way up to the church, I got to talk with you. You know how much First Congregational means to me. See, Ted grew up Catholic in a little small town. The only Protestant church in Pottstown, I guess, was First Congregational. So to Teddy, any, any non-denominational or any Protestant church was First Congregational. So Valley Bible was First Congregational to him. Parson, you know how much I love First Congregational, but I got to ask your permission. I want to marry my sister-in-law. I started thinking, wait a second, is this, light? is this legal? Is this like polygamy? Is this like Arkansas hillbilly sound? What are we doing here? <laughs> no, I, th I, I, th I think it's okay. Yeah, I fell in love with her. And she's a strong Christian. I said, well, that's awesome. Now, his brother Mike was a pastor. And so, long story short, we helped him get packed up, and, and, and Teddy went up to Michigan and married his on-fire, late 70-year-old Janet. And this is the picture of their, their wedding picture. <clears throat> I got a call from Janet two weeks ago. Teddy passed. It was a blessing. It really was. He was, he was getting dementia, and, and it was a real blessing that he passed. Uh, we baptized Teddy before he left to go up to Michigan. And uh, probably our, if not the biggest, one of our biggest testimonies that Valley Vegas has. But you know what to begin with? It began with just a hand. Would you like a hamburger? That's where it started. It doesn't have to be earth shaking. You never know where uh, just a hand will lead you. It may, it may lead nowhere. Let's be real. Oftentimes you help people and eventually they go right back to the mud. We know that. But you know what? As long as they're making progress. My line is, as long as people are making progress, I'll keep helping them. If you're not trying harder than me, I'm done trying. But if you're trying, I'll help you. And then you go a step, I'll go a step with you. And, and, and you'd be surprised that you'd have, you know, teddies, but you don't have a bunch of people in between. But it begins with a helping hand. And, and how can we help those people? See, that could be us, right? Just a couple bad decisions. And so let's continue to be. I don't even have to encourage you. You're such a great church. I don't even have to tell you. Be more loving. You're loving. Just continue to be the way that you are, okay? That pleases the heart of God. And there, I fulfilled my promise. I told you the story of Teddy. That's Teddy. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you so much, God, for giving our church that uh, opportunity, Lord, to, to, to be there for Teddy. Only eternity will tell, God, what it meant to him and, and his family. Lord, there's more Teddies out there. Help us to be available. Help us to be ready. Help us to lend a hand. Father, I pray for the people here, God, Lord, that we, can, we can't help if, if we're slipping and sliding. If we're getting off track, if we're letting trespasses come in, if we keep letting our guard down, if we keep making the same mistakes over and over, we, we can't be available to help. So God, help us. Help us to stay on task, God. And if you're here in person, if you're listening online and you don't know the Lord, it's, it's so simple. It's stupidly simple how to get saved. All you have to do is say, God, I agree with you. I agree with you, God, that I'm a sinner. 
I agree with you, God, that Jesus paid the penalty for my sin. I agree with you, God, that I want you to come and live inside of me. I was made to live for you. I agree with you, God, that when I make that decision, you're, you'll give me your spirit and I will be born again. I'll have a new me. That's as simple as it is. I believe you, God, that I was meant to live for you and I'll try my very best to follow you. That's all it takes. You can do that right where you sit. You can do that in the comfort of your home. Give your life to Jesus Christ. You can look up. God bless you. Stand up. Let's worship a little bit more. Hey, everybody. We're so glad that you joined our online service today. It's been great having you. If you want to make a donation to our ministry, there's going to be some information on your screen right now to enable you to do that. Also want to encourage you to go and download the Valley Vegas Church app. It's the one-stop shop for all things Valley Vegas. You can listen to sermons. You can watch our live streams. Uh, you can follow along with us on our daily reading. Uh, it's, it's really great, so I encourage you to go download that today. Also, definitely head to our social media platforms. Uh, it's just Valley Vegas. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and everywhere else. Wherever you're tuning in from today, we're so happy that you joined our online service and we look forward to seeing you guys again real soon. Take care.